let's get started for today. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to introduce um, Bill Phillips, the business of Notre Dame. Um, rather than going through the bio, uh, which we've had trouble getting, hopefully we've had a chance to read, I thought I'd tell you a few things that aren't in uh, the bio. So uh, I've known Bill for now going on about 10 years, and we met at a meeting of the North American Membrane Society. Uh, I think it was in Houston, and we met over a beer. And I think that's a great way to, to meet people. You know, so that was lots of fun. Um, and uh, a few years ago, when the Faculty of Engineering sent a uh, sort of a team uh, out to the University of Notre Dame, Bill was one of the key uh, folks there. Uh, and we had some great discussions uh, about how what he was doing was aligned with a lot of the work that was happening here at Master. And then as a follow-up to that, we actually had the opportunity to send two of our undergrad students um, that went um, on some research opportunities, uh, Ryan LaRue and uh, Frank Van Everly. Uh, so that was a great opportunity for those who would have spent some time at the end of the summer. Um, and uh, we've been collaborating on two different projects, and I've been wanting him to come and visit the country for a very long time. And so I'm so glad that he made it. Good to see you. It's been too long, and I'm looking forward to your talk. Awesome. Uh, thank you, David, for the incredibly kind introduction uh, and for the opportunity to be here today. Um, uh, the thing that David doesn't mention is that that, that NAMS meeting where we met, uh, David was uh, acknowledged as one of the North American Membrane Society's Young Investigator Award winners, and so uh, a very accomplished researcher uh, and even better friend after meeting over a beer in Houston. Um, and so. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity. Uh, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're doing at the University of Notre Dame uh, in collaboration with a whole bunch of great folks like Professor Latulip and Ryan and Graham, uh, as well as folks at Purdue University uh, and a few other places. And broadly what we're going to be interested in doing is taking uh, advanced materials, nanostructured polymers, and finding a way to process those nanostructured polymers in hopefully a scalable manner uh, into next generation membranes. And there's two features that these uh, polymers possess that I think are most useful uh, for advancing membrane science. Uh, the first is implied by the picture in the top right corner. Their well-defined nanostructures make them good filters. And, and so as a team, we've worked very hard to learn how to make better filters out of these membranes. And, and I think we've made some with that progress in mind, we've begun to think about how we can modify their surface chemistry for a variety of directed applications. And I kind of highlight that there with the lotus leaf and the gecko. A little bit more about the gecko and their interesting surface characteristics later. Um, but, but that's kind of what motivates our desire to modify the, the pore wall chemistry of these membranes. Let's do this. Before I go ahead and get into the meat and potatoes of the talk, it'd be ignorant of me not to go ahead and thank the folks that have actually done this work. And that's the fantastic graduate students, postdocs and undergraduate students uh, that work with me as part of the water lab at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, there, there's a bunch of great collaborators and some folks who are very nice to help support the, the work financially. Uh, but really this is the work of the people in the top right corner. And so the lab is nicknamed the Water Lab, and that's because when I joined in 2011, uh, Mark McCready was the department chair, and he said the only good thing an assistant professor does is come up with a terrible nickname or acronym for their lab. And so I was more than happy to advise with the Water Purification and Advanced Transport Engineering Research Lab, right? So we work in water treatment and water purification, and so uh, we felt like this was perfect. And, and get used to this. Uh, you, you ask why work on, on water treatment and water purification? Well, first, water is a global issue and one of the developed as well as developing nations uh, in significant manners over the next uh, uh, decades and centuries. And so this map here highlights water stressed areas and it's projected that by 2050, about 70% of the world's population will spend one month of the year in a water stressed state. And so that means that what we're extracting more water from the ground is being naturally replenished by the hydrological cycle. And the implications of this 
uh, in terms of, of human water consumption are, are obviously a major issue. Right? And, and one way to highlight that is what happened in Cape Town, South Africa several years ago, uh, the year after it happened in Chennai, India. And if you look at what's happening in uh, the Western United States with the drought state at the moment, it, it's a pretty significant issue, right? And so Cape Town was uh, particularly a drastic instance because they were being pushed up against day zero, which means that there wouldn't have been water available for uh, municipal consumption, right? And, and we think about the human health impacts of that and not having drinking water as being a serious issue, but there's also consequences beyond that. The economic impact of that is that there's companies cited with processing plants in these metropolitan areas and these areas where there's water available and they have particular uh, sort of uh, rights to a particular volume of water and as they move closer and closer uh, to extreme uh, drought states those rights get restricted further and further and, and so they can't be processing as much and so there's job implications and social implications beyond just the simple uh, being able to drink clean water and support human health activity. Okay. And, and then th this quote by Mark Twain discussing water rights uh, in the American Southwest it is a favorite. Uh, not sure if it actually uh, Mark Twain who said it. Uh, nonetheless, it's a good quote. Uh, Whiskey is for drinking and, and water is for fighting. All right? And so talking about uh, the, the conflicts that occur over water rights in the American Southwest. And, and uh, I think it was Michael Burry who's sort of the investor made famous by the, uh, uh, the movie, The Big Short regarding the housing crisis, uh, sort of highlighted that the natural resource that we'll fight over in the 21st century is water, right? So we fought over oil and petroleum in the 20th century, water is gonna become that issue going forward. And so we need to find ways and means of producing uh, fresh drinking water and water for a variety of applications. And, and then to kind of transition into the, uh, the, the talk topic a little more uh, bluntly, uh, I water uh, area where we as chemical engineers and material scientists and environmental engineers can make some pretty significant impact. And, and the, the reason I say that, if we think about the length scales over which membranes are designed, they may be designed at the molecular level, but those molecular level uh, materials are used to make uh, nanostructured materials that have particular uh, porosities and structures that are useful uh, in, in uh, separating or filtering contaminants. And then we need to work that up into making devices that can be actually used to treat large volumes of water. And, and as we begin to think about uh, creating devices that are plugged into parts of, of systems and infrastructure, we wanna contemplate how to best sequence these right, as we move up these length scales. And chemical engineers and environmental engineers and material scientists have made great strides in all of these areas. But I think chemical engineers in particular are very well suited uh, to cover this whole range of length scales. And so that sort of motivation for moving into this space of developing membranes for water. And uh, we've got a great research group at the University of Notre Dame uh, about half of the group focuses on developing new materials and about half of the group focuses on thinking about how to characterize those materials better and how to plug those into a system. Um, because this is the Brockhouse Institute of Materials Research, today I'm gonna focus primarily on this side of the research group's efforts in terms of making new materials and transforming them into membrane or other separation devices. Okay. And but let's talk a little bit more about how we can contemplate membrane design across multiple length scales in this uh, sort of idea, right? In this sort of area. And so first let's start with what we wanna design or make out of the molecules or materials, right? If I wanna make a better membrane, I probably wanna be able to control its pore structure. I probably want to have a high density of porous domains so stuff goes through it quickly. And I want that material to be resilient and operate stably for long periods of time in the context of whatever application or environment it gets plugged into. And so when you think about that, what I want you to think about is this diagram here that appears on almost every membrane manufacturer's website. And so along the bottom x-axis is a characteristic length scale. 
Ugg scale. So we go from angstroms on the left all the way up to millimeters on the right. And then in the top portion is there's some contaminant that you'd like to remove from water, right? So you don't wanna be drinking a bunch of sand with your water. And so you'd like to find some material that will allow water to go through and retain sand. And then at smaller length scales, you don't wanna be drinking salty seawater. And so you wanna find something that allows water to go through, but retains the hydrated ions that make up dissolved salts. And over that whole range, there's a membrane separation capable of separating water or allowing water to pass and retaining the, the other molecule. And so the implication is that the pore size or the characteristic feature size of these membranes we engineer is gonna be important. And, and I've had a lot of great conversations with folks here, uh, but with a very application oriented viewpoint. And, and I particularly applaud that because the other thing that happens is we can make nice new materials but those materials need to get plugged into large scale systems, right? And so, but when we think about large scale systems, we're thinking about maximizing product recovery, being able to operate the system stably over long periods of time uh, and a variety of things of that nature, right? And so to maybe tie this in more with scale, I'll point out that I did my graduate studies at the University of Minnesota. And there I had the opportunity to visit the uh, ultrafiltration plant at Columbia Heights that has finished the water distance of Minneapolis and St. Paul. And it's a big ass plant. I mean, it is huge. And so there are just a few of the skids that are used to filter about 70 million gallons per water of day. Sorry, 70 million gallons of water per day, right? And they do it operating about 30 to 40 PSI. And the way they get that uh, uh, throughput is they use about 1.7 uh, times 10 to the fifth meters squared. It's about 1.7 uh, million square foot of membrane area. And, and the way they get all of that area per volume in there is by using these membrane modules. And so they use spiral wound modules or hollow fiber modules. But the way to think about a spiral wound module is for those of you who are a little bit older is the Sunday newspaper, right? The Sunday newspaper used to have a whole bunch of sheets of paper stacked up and then you would roll it up and stuff it into the little bag that got tossed on the porch. And that's the same way you can get a huge surface area per volume in spiral wound modules, right? And so you can see sort of the flow profile that occurs there, but we're talking about making membranes over a large, uh, large area. And so if I think about what I wanna do as I try and transition next generation or, or nanostructure materials into next generation membranes, I wanna be able to capitalize on the material properties that I get from well-defined pore structures and chemistries, but I wanna do so in a manner that allows me to maximize surface area per volume or to make large or, or something that could be conceivably scaled up to a large system, right? And so again, highlighting the large surface area volume associated with these spiral wound or hollow fiber membrane modules. And we've got one more constraint in all of this is that in order to get this high throughput, I wanna make sure that I have thin active layers. And so the resistance to flow needs to be thin. I don't care if you prefer the solution diffusion model at the top or a pore flow model on the bottom, they both go as one over the thickness of the active layer. And so that means I want thinner membranes rather than thick membranes. And that means making membranes that are 100 nanometers to maybe 100 microns in thickness with large surface areas. Okay. And so that's the setup. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how we as a research group are thinking about uh, making large membrane areas with nice self-assembled nanostructures, but it's Friday afternoon, uh, Canadian Thanksgiving is this weekend I hear, and I don't think I'm gonna keep you all with me the whole time. And so I'm gonna give you the three big conclusions I want you to remember by the end of the talk now, so that if you zone out or you fall asleep, you can pick back up at some point in time, or you can just fall asleep and take a nice nap before you drive home and remember these three points, right? So the first point, is that I do think material science and engineering is making a lot of nice progress in identifying materials platforms that are pushing the physical limits of size selective filtration membranes. I'll show you some examples. 
using block copolymer materials, but people are doing a lot of nice things with a variety of other material platforms. And so I don't wanna uh, poo poo their work, but this is our platform of choice. <laughs> Because size selective filtration is being pushed to a limit, what we're thinking about how we can modify pore wall chemistries post assembly or post synthetically. And this is enabling a lot of new applications. And we'll talk about how to make membrane sorbents for the removal of heavy metal contaminants from water. And that will be one example where we're able to lock in a nice nanostructure and then elaborate upon the pore wall chemistry for a targeted application. And then the last area that, that's a little bit more speculative, but I think with a ton of promise, is that advanced manufacturing or additive manufacturing and 3D printing is providing ways to control the chemistry and structure of membranes across multiple length scales. And, and that engineering handle uh, provides and opens up a lot of opportunities. We'll talk about hierarchical sorbents in, in that context. Okay. Here we go. And at the core of all three of those approaches is the idea of a non-solvent induced phase separation technique. So this is the way that a lot of commercial membranes are made. And there's three simple components to this uh, technique in principle. Some polymer, solvent and organic solvent until you have a homogeneous solution. And so you have your nice homogeneous solution and then you spread it into a thin film using a doctor blade. And a doctor blade is nothing more than a glorified butter knife. It allows me to control the thickness of the film that results. And after that occurs, I might choose to allow the, let some solvent evaporate. I might not, but I fix the membrane structure in place by plunging it into a non-solvent bath where the exchange of solvent and non-solvent causes that solution to go through a phase separation process, right? So it goes through a, uh, it enters the miscibility gap and I form some polymer rich and some polymer poor regions to create the membrane structure. And, and this approach has been used quite successfully on the commercial scale. And, and so I'll show you this video, which I took off of YouTube. So here they've dissolved their polymer to form a homogeneous solution. And then this white roll there is being pulled under it and that metal blade is putting a thin layer of polymer onto the surface of this non-woven support. So as you see, as it comes down, it's shiny before it gets plunged into that non-solvent bath. And so it sits in that non-solvent bath to fully exchange the solvent and non-solvent. And then they put a little bit of post-treatment on it in, to uh, preserve the pore structure as it's being shipped or, or put into hollow fiber or spiral wound modules in this instance. And, and I love the uh, two women pulling the, the sheet of formed membrane out because it gives you an idea of how large these samples are when they're made at the industrial scale, right? And then they get sectioned up and rolled up like the Sunday newspaper. And, and so we're all kind of on the same page with, with the technique as we walk through it. They're often understood in terms of these ternary phase diagrams. And so I'll walk you through it. On the ternary phase diagram, each of the three corners is the pure material. Each edge of the triangle is a binary mixture, right? So that uh, homogeneous polymer solution would sit on that uh, edge of the triangle that's slanted from the bottom left to the top, right? And then as we move into the middle, we have three component mixtures that can be represented on this triangular plot. Importantly, when we go ahead and execute this non-solvent induced phase separation technique, the polymer and the non-solvent are not miscible with each other. And so that blue line that shows up labeled the binodal indicates the phase equilibrium. So if I'm inside of that blue region, that sort of blue curve parabola, that's where I'll form two phases, a polymer rich phase and a polymer poor phase. And the, the phase that you form is determined by which tie line you land on, and then you just phase separate on the tie line. And so when we formulate those polymer solutions, we'll often formulate them as pure polymer and pure solvent. So they land on that edge of the triangle, like I stated, 
they're often about 15 to 20 percent by weight polymer and solvent. Our non-solvent is often water. Sometimes we'll put a little bit of solvent into our non-solvent to slow the phase precipitation process. And I'll show you an example of that slower precipitation later. But pure water is the bottom right vertice of this triangle. And so then when we plunge that cast solution into the non-solvent and we have that solvent non-solvent exchange, but we begin to have mixture and we move into that two-phase region defined by the binodal. Let's say we land on this particular tie line. Then we would phase separate along the tie line to form our polymer rich phase on the top portion of the binodal line and our polymer poor phase on that bottom uh, edge of our triangle. And, and it's that polymer rich and polymer poor phase that then forms the nanostructure of our membrane. The, the parts that appear bright in this SEM micrograph are the polymer rich portion they form the matrix of the membrane. And the parts that appear dark or black are the polymer pore region. They form the porous structure of our membrane. And, and so this nanoporous structure and the fact that we've got pores of a particular size it is why these membranes get end, are ended up used in filtration processes. And, and so that's to say that they usually follow things along the top portion of, of this process flow in the bottom left. And so we take our non-traditional water source, whether it's wastewater or some seawater, and we treat it with our filtration membrane. The potable water goes through and the bad stuff that we don't want to be drinking gets retained. And so this idea of just a simple filtration like straining spaghetti through a colander is how those membranes that are made by uh, phase inversion processes are usually uh, deployed. And, and there's a lot of uh, other applications of them. I know uh, folks in this department and this university use these beautifully in biomedical applications, right? Um, where I think they have a ton of value. But if I were to think about trying to make a better membrane, then what I would like to do is go ahead and create a porous structure where I still have a whole bunch of pores, right? The phase inversion membranes or the membranes made by phase separation techniques do a nice job. They still have a whole bunch of pores in them but they don't have a nice single well-defined size like the block polymer materials do. And so our first efforts as a research team were targeted at thinking about how to make membranes from self-assembled polymers. Can we go ahead and use non-solvent induced phase separation techniques along with these self-assembled block polymer materials in order to create better filtration membranes? Just a little bit about the materials platform we're working with. A dye block copolymer has two blocks, right? A red block and a blue block. And much like oil and water, they don't want to mix. They would phase separate like your Italian vinaigrette. But you go ahead and you tie a covalent bond between the two segments, the red and the blue block, and they start pulling on each other like a rubber band. And that uh, conformational entropy means that they can't phase separate across large length scales and instead they micro phase separate to form a variety of nanostructures like those you see along the top of this slide. And, and primarily the thing that determines what nanostructure you'll form is the relative amount of red block to the relative amount of blue block. And so we're gonna be working with about 75% red block and 25% blue block, which forms these hexagonally packed cylindrical micro domains where the cylinders will be what become our, our polymer membrane. And, and I will be happy to talk to anyone about the technique uh, after, but we've spent a lot of time thinking about what solvents we need to pick to do this, as well as what evaporation times need to be utilized and what evaporation rates need to be utilized to direct the self-assembly of this hexagonally packed cylinder. But once we optimize for all of those conditions, when we go ahead and operate the technique in the lab, it, it looks very similar, I would argue, to what you do for the commercial casting process. There's our homogeneous solution. We use a hand-pulled doctor blade instead of using the, the blade coder that's done at the commercial scale. There's an evaporation step, and the evaporation step is critical in the 
uh, approach that we're using because it increases the polymer uh, concentration right at the solution air interface, driving that self-assembly. And then we just plunge it into a non-solvent bath to kinetically trap the polymer structure in place. And when that's done correctly, what we've had a lot of success creating asymmetric membranes with a thin self-assembled active layer. So that membrane that gets pulled out of the uh, bath that you saw on the last video, we can punch, you know, one centimeter, or sorry, one inch diameter circles out and put them into our test cells. And when we go ahead and drill down on the cross-sectional morphology right at the selective layer, support layer interface, it, you see these hexagonally packed cylinders percolating from the top surface of the membrane down into the support layer to create this ideal filter. But we have one additional sort of handle that we can play with when we think about uh, these self-assembled block polymers. I, I told you that the thing that determines which microstructure we form is the relative amount of red block to blue block, right? But if I just make a bigger polymer at the same ratio of materials, I should still form the same nanostructure just with the larger characteristic size, right? So if I have four parts of red and one part of blue, or if I've got eight part of red and two part of blue, it should be the same nanostructure, but I should be able to increase the characteristic pore size. And so but we've been able to do that in uh, some of our experiments where but we could make a 40 kilodalton overall molar mass block polymer, or we could make an 80 kilodalton overall molar mass block polymer at the same ratio of all of the components. And what you see in the resulting SEM micrographs of the top surface is that the pore size increases by about a factor of two. Now, the increase in molar mass by a factor of two and the increase of pore size by a factor of two, it, there, there, too few data to say what the actual correlation is. Um, that, that I think is just more of an interesting coincidence. The exciting thing for me uh, as someone interested in membrane science and membrane transport is that when we go ahead and then take these two membranes and test them in a solute rejection test or a molecular weight cutoff test, is that you can see this change in pore size percolate through to the membrane properties. And so the experiments I'll talk about on this slide do the following thing. They, they take a feed solution, but with different molecular weight PEO samples dissolved in it. And then they put the membrane right under the feed solution. And then we try and pass the feed solution through the membrane and collect the permeate, right? And so if the PEO molecules are too big to make it through the pores of the membrane, they end up getting rejected and their concentration is reduced. And so then when we report that as a percent rejection, they'll have a relatively high percent rejection because they didn't get through, okay. And, and so a, a lot of people who make these from the material perspective really hope that we'd be able to a step function molecular weight cutoff curve. And, and I'm here to tell you that's not because once you have solute sizes that are comparable in size to your pore size, there's an entropic or a steric hindrance that will present, prevent a portion of them from getting through, right? So our solute on the left, its projected area sits within the area of the pore and so it would get through. Our solute on the right, its projected area sits outside the pore and so it would get bounced off the pore wall and be rejected. And so that's why we end up with these slightly more uh, dispersed rejection profiles but they're pretty darn sharp when compared to uh, hindered transport theories or theories up for pores with a, a monodispersed size. And, and I think most excitingly, when we go ahead and we shift the molar mass of the templating block polymer, but we see a corresponding shift in the molecular weight cutoff curves. And, and so the one for me that helps me understand that this is going in the right direction is the one at 10,000 gram per mole that solute is making it through the 80 kilodalton, the bigger pore size, 75% of the time, whereas it's only making it through the smaller pore size about 20% of the time, right? Its rejection is higher. And so that green triangle is higher than the blue circle at 10 gram per mole, which is indicative of the shift in the molar mass or the molecular weight cutoff curve that we would expect. 
And uh, this is particularly nice because this was work that came explicitly from the collaboration between David's group and our team. And but we started looking at other types of copolymer architectures. And instead of using, say, block copolymers, we use uh, uh, graft copolymers or statistical copolymers with oligomeric side chains. That you can actually push your molecular weight cutoff curve down to the point where you're able to filter sucrose out of solution. And sucrose has a, a characteristic size of about one nanometer. And so we're pushing this pore size down to about two nanometers. So we go from about two nanometers on the small end all the way up to about 50 or 60 nanometers on the large end. Okay. And, and so uh, this is why I think uh, new material platforms are, are pushing the limits of size selectivity. We've got really sharp molecular weight cutoff curves we're able to go ahead and modulate the pore size and we're able to make them with what appears to be relatively scalable technologies, right? Things that add just a, an evaporation step uh, relative to non-solvent induced phase separation. And so with this sort of uh, success and this sort of capability, thinking about developing materials for a new application but we begin to think about how you might be able to take the bottom processing route to treat non-traditional water sources. So don't just view the water as the only valuable product to be uh, extracted from your treatment process. Contemplate the dissolved nutrients, the dissolved metals and, and polymeric substances within your non-traditional water source as a potential uh, resource to recover. You've got uranium and gold in seawater. You've got nitrate and phosphorus in municipal wastewater. Or, or, you know, that you might not need to treat your water to a drinkable standard. If I'm using it in an industrial process, I might think about a reuse strategy. But in order to do that, but we need some versatility and we need to be able to target different molecules uh, in different manners. And I, I really put like this slide and put it up because it highlights what you might envision in two different instances when someone says they've got metal ion contamination in their water, right? And so without specifying what metal ion it is, it could be lead that makes its way into drinking water because of the piping system in the Northeast and the Rust Belt, right? So this is water that can't be removed at a point of extraction and has to be removed at point of use because it's getting in there due to the, the piping system. Or it, it might be arsenic that occurs naturally in groundwater in the Central Valley of California and American Southwest, in particular Texas, right? And, and so here it's naturally occurring. And because it's in the groundwater, you could treat it at point of extraction before it gets to a wastewater treatment plant or a, a distribution system. And, and so there's versatility that's needed in these uh, emerging techniques. And, and I don't think size selective filtration is the way to pursue it. And so what we need to think beyond just the excess and begin to explore other modes of solute removal, right? So steric exclusion is essentially an entropic mechanism. And so we can go ahead and rely on enthalpic interactions. So van der Waals forces and electrostatic interactions and other types of molecular these specific interactions. I'm not so refined as to be able to deconvolute those two just yet. And so I'll just go ahead and call the axis stickiness, right? So we're gonna design our membrane pore chemistry for stickiness. If I had a really sticky membrane, you can imagine making membrane adsorbers like Professor Ghosh does, and they're able to selectively capture molecules from solution uh, but with high affinity. Well, on the other end, uh, as Abhishek and Matthew were showing me, they've got some really nasty water and the contaminants in that water will stick to the membrane surface as it operates. And so maybe you could create some anti-fouling surfaces that would resist the adhesion of these nasty bits as your membrane process was operating. And so this is why we're, we're trying to modulate the pore wall chemistry. And, and we're gonna talk about membrane adsorbers today. And, um, the idea is we're gonna make a membrane adsorber that can selectively grab heavy metal ion contamination out of drinking water. And the argument for membrane adsorbers is that they have very fast response times or short diffusion times. I could compare a membrane adsorber to a traditional packed bed 
and, and for the packed bed for the solute to get from the flowing solution to the binding sites, it's got to diffuse over a characteristic distance that's the diameter of the resin, right? So typically 100 to 300 micrometers in diameter. For the membranes that we're making, we'll have a characteristic distance of about 100 to 300 nanometers, and so much faster response times. Okay. And we're not gonna do it with self-assembled block polymer materials. We're gonna use a slightly different technique. And so we're still gonna use non-solvent induced phase separation. And we're gonna dissolve a homopolymer polysulfone with a dye block polymer polystyrene polyacrylic acid. And we're still gonna pull it down into a thin film using a doctor blade, but then we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna precipitate it using humid environment rather than plunging it into a non-solvent bath. And the reason for that is that the exchange of water vapor and non-solvent is much slower, leading to a slower precipitation and a lacier spongy-like structure, rather than just plunging it into a water bath where I have very rapid solvent-non-solvent -solvent exchange. And we see that, so if I expose it to the humid environment for zero seconds, I plunge it directly into DI water, you have these large macro voids that aren't that useful in the context of creating a lot of surface area per volume. 45 seconds, you begin to see this lacy, spongy-like structure that we want, but at the end, there's still these macrovoids. At 90 seconds, we've given the polymer material enough time to phase separate the slow solvent, non-solvent exchange creates the desired nanostructure across the whole thickness. The other nice thing then is that the block polymer is amphiphilic. And so the polystyrene bits like the polysulfone, and so they sort of bury themselves in the matrix of the membrane, whereas the polyacrylic acid bits are hydrophilic and like to stick out into the non-solvent, the aqueous environment. And if we anneal them, we'll really be able to pull them to the surface. And if you look closely, those little light lumps on the surface at these high magnification SEMs are consistent with the pore size, sorry, with the the brush size of these polyacrylic acid uh, moieties. And so, but we're happy with this nice spongy structure. We've got the polyacrylic acid brushes pulled to the surface. And the really nice thing about the polyacrylic acid chemistry is that it can be elaborated upon using simple carbonic coupling techniques. And we'll use the ability to capture copper from a solution to kind of indicate the chemical changes that are going on as we transition this membrane through the various reaction steps. And so for this Langmuir isotherm, we're plotting the amount of bound copper on the y-axis, and we're plotting the concentration of copper in solution on the x-axis. And there's two parameters that define the Langmuir isotherm. Capital Q is the saturation capacity, What's the most amount of material, in this case, copper ions I could put on the surface at saturation? And K, the affinity, but which defines what sort of solution I'm able to treat, right? Higher affinities mean I'm able to remove ions from even lower concentration solutions. And so we have the Langmuir isotherm for the polyacrylic acid functionalized membranes as the red diamonds, and it's got a modest uptake of copper ions at a nominal uh, affinity. The first thing we do is we couple polyethylene amine, uh, branched polyethylene amine uh, molecules to the surface. And so this creates higher density of binding sites. And so we have more binding sites, a higher ability to remove copper ions from solution. And that manifests in an upward shift of the isotherm for the blue circles, blue squares. I know my shapes, uh, blue squares but relative to the red diamonds. And then we can go through one additional step and add a terpiridine functional group developed or not developed, but being used by uh, our collaborators in the Weber group that has a very high affinity or known high affinity for transition metal ions. And so it's carboxylated. And so it can also be uh, coupled to the PEI moieties. And the exciting thing is, is that we see this manifest in the Langmuir isotherm. And so if I use the same axes that I had previously, the terpiridine molecule saturates at less than one millimolar, right? The high affinity 
means that the Langmuir isotherm essentially smushed up against the y-axis. And so if we go ahead and change the x-axis so that it runs just from zero to one millimolar, but we see this saturation type behavior for the terpiridine functionalized molecule. And the, the blue color is indicative of that, the high copper concentration on their surface. This video shows the, the rapid mass transfer that results from membrane sorbents. And so we take our initially white opaque membrane, and then we're able to swish it around a little bit in our copper solution, 90 seconds. And after 90 seconds, it comes out as this brilliant blue color because of the high concentration of copper ions that have been fixed to the surface. And then we can go ahead and put it in a release solution, shake it around in the release solution a little bit, and then we pull it out and it's returned to its original opaque white color because the copper ions have been released. And so this ability to uh, regenerate and reuse the, the sorbent is attractive. And we were able to regenerate and reuse this material uh, to 50 times before uh, the student graduated and decided that 50 cycles was enough. Right? So, so it's very attractive in terms of the ability to manipulate the Langmuir isotherm and regenerate and reuse. Uh, but I think the, the most exciting result in my perspective is captured in this slide right here, where let's think about some more hazardous heavy metal ions. And so we'll talk about six part per million lead or cadmium contamination. And we'll take 10 milliliters of this solution, plop a little bit of our membrane in there, shake it around for a short period of time like we did in the prior video, extract the membrane, and then measure the concentration of metal ion contaminants using ICP-OES in that retained solution. And this is the results from the ICP-OES analysis, right? So this says about 10, or sorry, 10,000 part per billion because that's part per billion cadmium chloride. And so the two chloride ions account for the missing four part per billion uh, that, that's not in there. The more important part is, is that after treatment, there's 13 part per billion cadmium chloride in that retained solution. So we're able to remove 99.9% .9 of the heavy metal ion contamination in this solution. And most excitingly to me is that this persists in deionized water, which you see in the red bars, in a uh, simulated groundwater, which you see in the blue bars, or a synthetic seawater, which you see as these bars in the synthetic seawater has about 35,000 part per million competing or interfering electrolytes trying to find uh, uh, those binding sites as well. But we can also do breakthrough curve experiments with these, um, these thin film membrane adsorbers. And so we've got two uh, uh, solutions here. One, that's a mixture of cadmium, lead, and mercury. And we don't see any of those metal ions in the permeate, at least based off of our capabilities with ICP-OES and our limits of detection. For the cadmium and copper, I, I like that best because what we see is that we never see copper come out in the permeate because it's got a huge affinity for the terpiridine moieties, but we're able to capture cadmium for a short period of time before the copper just outcompetes it. And so because the copper is outcompeting it, you can see this breakthrough of cadmium. And so it speaks to the selectivity of this functional group for copper over cadmium. Uh, and it also speaks to the rapid mass transfer and sharp breakthrough uh, that we can get with these membrane adsorbers. Okay. But the last thing I'll say about this is in that bottom experiment with the cadmium and copper, that one part per million feed solution is completely clear. After treating hundred milliliters of that feed solution, the membrane top surface has now turned this brilliant blue color because of all the copper ions that have been fixed on the surface. Right? So just another indication of it, it's strong performance. And, and so hopefully this suggests the ability to post aesthetically modify these materials has some promise and it doesn't need to be targeted at the recovery of heavy metal ions. 
but we've demonstrated that we can put a variety of other functional groups on the pore walls, and those could be targeted for uh, biological samples or PFAS or, or other contaminants of concern. Right. And so in the last 10 minutes here, I, I wanna talk a little bit about advancing beyond those thin film membrane absorbers. So uh, the membrane absorbers are nice because they have really fast mass transfer. And so we get those sharp breakthroughs and, and those fast response times. But admittedly, they have pretty limited capacity, right? They're thin membranes. And so there's not a lot of material there to go ahead and capture stuff with. And, and so, okay, I could stack a couple of membranes on top of each other in order to increase the capacity. But you'll remember on that first slide, throughput goes down as the thickness goes up. Right, and so we'd like to find some way to get the depth of the resin beds or thicker membrane stacks at least, and the rapid mass transfer membranes. And so uh, what Xiaoling Zhu has been really pushing hard on is 3D printing hierarchical absorbents, where with the material that we print, the filaments has the same chemistry and structure as those membrane thin film absorbents I just talked about, but we're able to purposefully uh, program in large channels that allow for high throughput, right? And so the, the way this technique works is it uses that same uh, humid air vapor induced phase separation technique. And, and now instead of taking a formulated and film, put it into a syringe pump that dispenses that solution uh, uh, from the top of a Z axis controller. And, and then our, our substrate, our, our, our membrane support sits on this XY controller. And so we're able to extrude this solution, have it extruded into a humid environment. So it's gonna go through that phase separation process as we're controlling the macro scale structure, right? And, and so the dream is that we'd be able to go ahead and extrude filaments that have nanoporosity, like the membrane absorbents we just talked about, but we're able to purposely program in these large flow channels between the filaments. And because we haven't changed the formulation of the, the solution too much, we could then go through the exact same type of post-synthetic modification of these membranes or of these uh, structured filters. So the, the first thing that I'll point out is that you can't just print the solution on its own. If you try and do that, you make a little bit of a mess. And that's because what we want to modify the rheological characteristics of these solutions. And the way we do that is through the addition of carbon nanotubes. And those rod-like carbon nanotubes have two effects. They create a more pronounced shear thinning behavior, which you see from the shear rheology traces on the left, where we plot the shear stress versus the shear rate. And so as you increase the carbon nanotube concentration, you increase the shear thinning uh, response where at high shear rates you flow like a liquid and at low shear rates you act more like a solid. But more importantly, the addition increases the extensional viscosity of this solution. And so it delays the pinch off time. And so the, the way you think about that physically is instead of having little droplets ejected from your printhead, we're able to extrude continuous filaments or continuous tubules from our printhead. And, and so it, it do it poorly and we just extrude droplets, we make a mess like I told you. And so this is a structured filter tried to be made from a solution without any carbon nanotubes added. If Xiaoling adds in just 0.1 weight percent carbon nanotubes, then this is what the process looks like. We're able to go ahead and, and with our uh, printer raster back and forth X, Y, and Z, and create these wood pile structures. And so we go back and forth and you're seeing the solution being extruded in real time. And then she switches to uh, the, the orthogonal dimension. And after doing that for a set number of layers, macroscopically, you see this structure here in the top left. So now we don't make a mess. Now we have some gray membrane because of the addition of the carbon nanotubes, but you can see the large flow channels that we've incorporated into these materials. And as we begin using a variety of microscopy techniques to just look 
close, more and more closely, it, you can see the large flow channels with our filament making up the structure of the filter. Getting closer, here's the large flow channel and here's the filaments. And, and when we really zoom in to the nanostructure at a high magnification uh, of the filament, it, you see a lone carbon nanotube sort of uh, tracing through the material. But again, you see these polyacrylic acid uh, nodules sitting on the surface. And, and so um, once again, these materials are able to go ahead and be functionalized and, and capture copper from solution. And, and that's what we're showing in the left here. The, the most important thing is, is that as we change the number of layers, you see a corresponding change in the saturated amount of copper uh, captured, right? So the uh, capture capacity of the 12 layer terpyridine membrane is about three times higher than that of the four layer. And the 24 layer is about two times higher than the 12 layer, which means that all of the binding sites are accessible. And, and we've got pretty large permeabilities for those that care about this type of thing. The, the hydraulic permeability of the 24 layer membrane is about 100,000 LMH per bar. So pretty notable. And then we could go ahead and do a breakthrough curve again. And now we begin to see that we wanna design these a little bit more intelligently. We wanna think about what is the channel distance that reduce the channel thickness, or sorry, the channel diameter and increase the membrane thickness. We see that our breakthrough curve shifts further and further down because we're giving the molecules enough time to be captured. And so th there's some real room for engineering these at both the uh, nanostructure scale as well as the micrometer and uh, millimeter structure scale, but it, it's an encouraging first result. And so uh, this is one example where I think advanced manufacturing provides a lot of opportunity uh, to control structure and chemistry uh, across multiple length scales. And, and so I'll, I'll leave with two quick slides on future directions for, for these things. The first is that I think that there's a whole bunch of open space for functionalized membranes, whether it's responsive materials, membrane sorbents, anti fouling uh, materials, materials that exhibit um, solute selective transport behavior. There's a, a bunch of space to, to uh, explore there, but I think one of the key things to bridge this back to making it a scalable technique is we need to think about functionalization routes that are rapid. And we can't use things that would be amenable to lab scale operations. We need to think about roll to roll operations. And so, but we used carbonamide coupling chemistry, which is the fifth one over on this plot here. If we go across the, um, the X axis, our estimates say you need to be in that red range to be consistent or have reaction rate constants that are consistent with roll to roll processing. And so, the encouraging thing is, is that there's a variety of reaction mechanisms that have reaction rates that are fast enough to do that. You've got thiolene reactions, uh, azide alkyne, uh, uh, copper catalyzed azide alkyne cycloaddition, right? One of the things that just won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. So there's a variety of ways we could go about doing this. And, and the blue band is if you get to the point where that reaction rate is diffusion limited, you can be thinking about patterning the surface chemistry of these membranes and creating different types of surface patterns. And we've begun to contemplate this in the context of charged mosaic membranes where we've got the same membrane surface. And so these actually go ahead and through some very interesting mechanisms that we're just beginning to understand, transport dissolved ions faster than water and faster than neutral dissolved molecules. And so it might be a way uh, of doing um, buffer exchange or a way of selectively transporting ions. But this is enabled by this combination of controlled nanostructure with rapid, rapid uh, post-synthetic modification of the membrane surface chemistry. And, and so with that, uh, I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to come and share some of what we're doing uh, with all of you here. I've had such a fantastic time hearing the exciting things that you're doing uh, and look forward to any questions and feedback you have and, and continuing the conversations. So thank you.
Yeah, so I think the, the, the thing that, that's implied there is you could probably filter things with a, a disperse um, pore size distribution. One of the nice things about having more uniform pore size distributions as we think about um, applications where maybe we have uh, a membrane sorbent or a flow through reactor is then you create a uniform residence time distribution across your membrane. And, and so maybe the way to think about it is in the context of a membrane adsorber. So if I have a membrane adsorber that has one big pore and one small pore, the big pore doesn't have a lot of capacity per volume because it's got a, a smaller surface area per volume. But most of the flow is gonna go through your big pore. And so you're gonna get breakthrough because of that uh, pore size distribution. And, and so I think that um, it, you're right to maybe suspect that you could probably do most filtrations with a polydispersed pore size distribution. But I think as you look at these other maybe emerging applications, that uniform residence time um, is gonna be a benefit uh, and, and that's gonna emerge largely from a, a tighter pore size distribution. I think a graduate student had a question. So I know the application that we showed with the SCM unit of the um, PSX membrane. Um, how much control do you have over the size of the pores that you see? So which pores, the pores between the filaments or the pores in the filament? That's a good question. Uh, I don't know the answer to that in any extent that I'd be comfortable answering. Um, I, I do know that we've been able to manipulate the casting solution formulation through a variety of techniques and, and get um, pore sizes that maybe go down to about uh, 50 or 100 nanometers and pore sizes that go up to about five micrometers. But I haven't thought about it in terms of what control we have as we sweep through that range, it's more just been, we've formulated a few things here and there and we've observed these types of pore sizes, um, but controlling it and understanding it, we, we don't have that capability yet. Oh, yes. Yeah, we, we do have a bit of a distribution of pore sizes. And yeah, I, I think um, I, I'd be interested if you'd share the paper on the where they incorporate the water soluble uh, polymers in there. That, there's, I think, a whole bunch of things we could do in terms of formulating those casting solutions and maybe just using casting solutions of just block polymers. Uh, and, and so, yeah, the, the mind runs wild with all the opportunities. I'm just happy to hear more about what's out there. Thank you. So yeah, um, sparingly and, and more and more nowadays, um, but those um, sorbents that we showed you, um, some of them actually have the capability of capturing neodymium and europium, uh, rare earth elements, and things that people are interested in. Um, now the selectivity wasn't something that we really dug down with in, in that regard. So uh, take those results with a bit of a grain of salt, but uh, I think the ability to modify the pore chemistry becomes really attractive because th there's a spectacular literature in the adsorption community and the resin-based community about what can selectively capture lithium and what can selectively capture rare earth elements and a variety of other things. A and the hope is that we've got something that's modular enough where you can plug and play the chemistry. Um, but uh, at least as a first principle demonstration, we know that some of these can capture those uh, uh, emerging metal ions of interest. Before you leave, 
3D printing image. That was great. great uh, Thank you. Great. 3D printing, when you're depositing the filament, the path to it, what the polymer that's going to face that way. Does the orientation of your board in that filament change depending on the conditions under which you obtained it? Uh, you have those two folders. That's a, a great question, uh, and, and I will take that back to Xiaoling. Um, so th th part of the, the struggle, um, which is a very good struggle to have, is there's so many things we can change and so limited time to, to begin exploring that. But uh, I think maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you're thinking about if I uh, increase the translational velocity or I change the flow rate of the solution coming out of the printhead, can I impact the assembly process in some way? And I think that it's a great thing to explore. We just haven't gone in that direction. Yeah, even beyond that, screw things you are actually not solving. Ah. Right? You can take it off the source and actually fix it. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that that would be a really interesting thing to explore. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll get there. The, Part of the reason why I, uh, we were attracted to the humid environment well, was then we didn't have to worry about shear forces between the non-solvent and the, the printed filament because the air is pretty stress-free. But I, I think you're 100% correct. You could engineer the system to print directly into the non-solvent. And I think I've seen one or two papers do that. And so we should probably go take a look at those. Thank you. <clears throat> So at the start of the talk, you, you sort of discussed the preference of new material all the way through the dust bowl still as opposed to the container. I was wondering in your lab or uh, if you did in the this, but what would the process look like from taking this material that you've developed and making it to geometries that are, are used in the real world and testing them to see whether or not the developed the images can reflect these configurations and put into like geometries that are used in actual applications? Right. No, I, I so I am not the person to speak to that. Um, if you go and look online, there's a company called Terrapore Technologies, uh, and they, uh, Rachel Doran, who is the CEO and president, um, but was the person who helped me with the initial studies uh, of the ISV. I was a postdoc, and uh, she was a, a graduate student, and they are doing that. And so um, I, I don't want to, and I can't speak to exactly what they're doing in that regard, but they're having some good success uh, and I think it, it's a great question to ask because when you go from flat sheet in the stirred cell to a module, that there's a, a whole nother range of parameters that needs to be optimized and studied. I mean, so how stackable we can put those, yeah, I mean, we've done experiments where we've put multiple membranes in series uh, and, and you know we're still able to flow solution through them and, and the nice thing actually uh, is we did one experiment once never took a picture of it but we, darn it we should have um, where it was I think three membranes that we'd stacked and we flowed a copper solution through it uh, and then at the end of the experiment we never noticed any breakthrough but we took the first membrane off and it was the brilliant blue color all the way through. Uh, the second one had some blue spotting on the top surface and was white on the bottom. And then the last one was com still completely white. Um, and so that indicates that at least the flow is going through all of the membranes, um, but we just hadn't had the ability to saturate all of them. And so, yeah, they're, I, I don't, don't wanna say infinitely stackable, but they're uh, stackable up to at least five membranes in series, which we've done. Yes, I appreciate it.